Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is a morning update. It looks like the Ghislaine Maxwell bail situation is about to come to a head. The federal government has responded to Ghislaine Maxwell and her legal team and the assertions that they made about why Ghislaine Maxwell should get bail. Now, anyone with a working brain in their head should understand that someone like Ghislaine Maxwell doesn't deserve to be bailed out. Anybody with a working brain in their head should understand that Ghislaine Maxwell is not being treated in a a bad fashion, that Ghislaine Maxwell is not being treated like she's in a 10th century dungeon. She's being treated like any other high-profile inmate would be treated. In fact, she's even been entrusted with speaking to other inmates who might be suicidal. So, I don't want to hear any of this nonsense about her uh, living conditions and how it is just beyond the pale of abuse the way she is being treated. No, she's being treated like anyone else would be. What you're really mad about is that she's not being given preferential treatment that's due to a so-called member of polite society. That's what you're really mad about, right? Let's just cut to the chase. Let's cut through the fat and let's just get right down to the brass tacks of it. They think Ghislaine Maxwell deserves to be treated better than someone from the inner city who is also in jail awaiting a trial. They think that Ghislaine Maxwell, if she isn't treated better than your average inmate, then she's being treated wrong and she's being treated badly. And this was the point that her legal team was is trying to make to Judge Nathan. Thankfully, the prosecutors aren't having any of it. The prosecutors filed their own letter today, their own court filing with Judge Nathan, in response to the ludicrous assertions made by Ghislaine Maxwell and her legal team. Our article tonight excuse me, our article this morning is from the abcnews.go.com and the headline, Federal Prosecutors Push to Keep Ghislaine Maxwell Jailed. Question Statements About Husband. So, the federal prosecutors, as we all know, are not interested in letting Ghislaine Maxwell walk. If it was up to them, she most certainly wouldn't be going anywhere but that, the, the way the system works, they're allowed to petition the judge for bail, and then the judge has to make a decision one way or the other, depending on the facts presented to him or her. And to be honest with you here, folks, I don't see anything that Ghislaine Maxwell and her legal team has presented that they have not presented before. And the prosecution is saying the same exact thing. We've seen all of this before. These are repeats. We want some new programming. And I'm sure Judge Nathan feels the same way. I mean, I would guess anyway. Why are you going to waste my time and continue to send me briefs of the same exact stuff, basically, that I've already told you is not going to get you sprung? But Ghislaine Maxwell's legal team, for the money that they're being paid, they're like I've said from the beginning, they're going to throw as much shit against the wall as possible, hoping some of it sticks. It's not about guilt or innocence with Ghislaine Maxwell. It's about technicalities. And it, it's, it's quite obvious that that's what her legal team is gunning for here. It's no different than Jeffrey Epstein's legal team when he was in uh, jeopardy and when he was facing criminal penalties. It is all about the loopholes. It is all about the technicalities. Guilt or innocent does not matter when you're a so-called elite, when you have the sort of bankroll these people has. It doesn't matter because they're going to pay for not only a lawyer 
who can handle themselves in the courtroom, but they're going to pay for a lawyer who used to be a prosecutor, who has ties to the prosecutor's office still, and that's exactly what Ghislaine Maxwell did when she hired Everdell. Now, it seems to me that this time around, that's not going to matter. I don't think Alice and Moe and company are interested in having any sort of pleasant uh, heart-to-hearts with Ghislaine Maxwell's legal team at this point. This seems to be a pretty contentious situation. And Alice and Moe and the team in charge of prosecuting Ghislaine Maxwell have done a pretty good job, right? You know I'm very critical of all of this, of the way the government has um, prosecuted this case and the cases previously. But the current team, which is anchored by Alice and Moe, has done a really good job. And I would really like to see them knock it from a C plus B into an A range of a grade by announcing RICO charges. That would be fantastic. But the job they're doing here, as far as countering Ghislaine Maxwell and her legal team, point by point, every single time Maxwell's team attempts to snatch the narrative, has been a very, very solid job by Allison Moe and company, and hopefully they keep it up. Let's see what their letter, ha- what they had to say in their letter to Judge Nathan in this article. The authors of this article are James Hill and Aaron Katursky. Now, James Hill, like I've said, has done just a fantastic job with um, covering this Epstein case. So I'm keeping to uh, the the pattern of following his articles and using this next article that we're going to read from James Hill in collaboration with the first one by James Hill. So that way we have the whole entire story, all of the context, and all of the meat that is possible on the bone. Federal prosecutors in New York are urging a judge to reject Ghislaine Maxwell's second attempt to be released on bail in advance of her trial, arguing that she remains an extreme flight risk because of her foreign ties, her alleged lack of candor, and her demonstrated willingness and sophisticated ability to live in hiding, according to court documents made public on Friday. So, right off of the bat, in the first paragraph of this article, you see that the federal prosecutors are already coming out with both guns blazing. A lack of candor? Check. Foreign ties? Checked. Demonstrate a willingness to live sophisticated and to live in hiding? Eh, That's a check as well. She was engaging in all of that. None of that's disputed. What they'll say is, oh, well, she was trying to hide her communications and her movement from the media. From the media. Like the media was camped out in front of her house. Besides the Sun, the Daily Mail, and a few other outlets... Nobody was really charging hard after Ghislaine Maxwell. Give me a break. People were writing articles, but they were piggyback articles. Piggybacking off of the work that other people have already done. It wasn't investigative journalists hitting the streets looking for Ghislaine Maxwell. They couldn't have been bothered to do that. They were way too busy engaging in tribal warfare, folks. Maxwell who has pleaded not guilty to enabling and, in some cases, participating in deceased sex offender, pedophile, Jeffrey Epstein's alleged sexual abuse of three minors in the mid-1990s, argued again for release on bail in a motion earlier this month. And again, remember, just because they filed this letter with the court doesn't even mean that Judge Nathan is going to grant a hearing. She might just look at all of this, the written um, requests, and say, no, I'm not, I'm not even going to give this a second thought. We're not even going to bother with this. But we don't know if that's the action she's going to take, right? So as of now, as it stands, they have asked, Elaine Maxwell's lawyers, that is, have asked for a trial, uh, a hearing date of December 21st. Prosecutors have said if that's what Judge Nathan is okay with, then we're okay with it as well. But 
I'm guessing that the prosecutors hope that the wording of their letter is strong enough to sway Judge Nathan from wasting everybody's time again with this bail situation. I mean, how many times is Ghislaine Maxwell going to get a hearing for bail? Is everybody petitioning the judge this often, get get this many shots for bail? For some reason, I highly doubt it. Maxwell's submission included letters from her previously undisclosed husband and more than a dozen relatives and friends attesting to her forthright character and their confidence she would not flee. Yeah, I mean, this is somebody who is obviously has just an uh, an abundance of character, a moral compass that does not ever beat the wrong way, and somebody who would never engage in anything like this, according to her relatives and friends. I mean, I'm pretty sure you could get a dozen relatives and friends of anybody to write a glowing account of them. Hell, look at what people wrote about Jeffrey Epstein. Miss Maxwell would never destroy those closest to her by fleeing after they have risked so much to support her. Maxwell's attorneys wrote in the renewed motion for bail. Oh, please give me a break. And furthermore, I don't care about the destruction as far as um, reputationally the people uh, that the people around Ghislaine Maxwell uh, get get uh, involved with here. If you're going to co-sign for somebody like Maxwell, you're going to have to get ready for what comes next. You're going to have to get ready for scrutiny. You're going to have to get ready for the fallout. Now, that doesn't mean anyone should harass these people. I don't think anyone should do that. That's really not my, uh, not my skilo anyway. I don't, I don't engage in all of that nonsense on social media like all of you know. And if you're out there harassing people on social media, come on, get a grip. Just don't do it. It's not, it's not worth your time, right? Especially these idiots. The karma train is coming for these people no matter what, folks. Believe that shit. It's already left the station. It's lumbering down the tracks. It's coming through the tunnel. And the light that you see, that little speck at the very far end of the tunnel, that is the karma train that is coming down the tracks to take care of these people. And quickly following the karma train, is the federal prison bus. So these people are all going to get taken, uh, they're, they're, they're all going to be uh, aired out, and they're all going to face a lot of scrutiny, right? And if you co-sign for Ghislaine Maxwell, then it's game on. You should face that scrutiny. So all of these people who are talking about, oh, well, we're worried about people threatening... I don't... You know, look. Ghislaine Maxwell and the people who are coming out to defend her have every right to do that. This is America. That's how this works. That is how this works. But at the same time, don't try and get people to quit talking about the situation by throwing out ludicrous statements such as, oh, Ghislaine's security is in jeopardy, like they were saying leading up to her arrest. I call that bullshit from the very beginning. In jeopardy from who? Nobody in the media even cared. From some weird, crazy people on the internet? Give me a break. Everybody deals with psychopaths on the internet. Anybody anybody who does anything, even partly in the public view, is going to come across a psychopath psychopath or two. I've had my share, believe it. You ignore them and move on, right? But their strategy is, what they want to do is try and make it out so nobody talks about the case even. They want it to be shrouded in mystery like it always has been because that's the the best terrain for them to operate. When the public doesn't have any of the the, um, information, when the public is only being gaslit, that is the perfect time for the so-called elite to control the narrative. Now that that narrative has been snatched from from them, now that the shoe is on the other foot and the predator has become the prey, they don't know what to do, folks. But prosecutors cast Maxwell's pitch for a $28 million bail package as a rehash of arguments previously rejected by the court at a detention hearing in July, two weeks after Maxwell's arrest. 
And that is the position I have taken with this as well. This is just a, a, a retread, right? We're doing a rehashing of everything that they presented already. Nobody has the time for it. Nobody wants to deal with it. But yet, Ghislaine Maxwell's high-profile lawyers have to make themselves seem useful, right? So they're going to go hard, and they're going to try and use every little bit of leverage they have. COVID, we'll use it. Ghislaine Maxwell's supposedly draconian conditions in jail, we're using that too. Oh, a couple of unhinged maniacs on the internet talk trash? Oh yeah, let's use that too. We're going to pile that on in there as well and say, there's a security threat. Whatever they can possibly use, they will use. You know what they will not say? And you know what they're not going to try and say? That she's innocent. Because they know at this point, they can't even, they can't even prove that, right? They know that the evidence is stacked a mile high against them. And all they have to go on are technicalities and loopholes and backroom deals and wrangling. Unfortunately for them, that's not going to work this time. And Ghislaine Maxwell, the only way she's going to reduce her prison sentence from 175,000 years is to start rolling over on other people involved. And then she might get a few years knocked off, but I don't see how, if RICO is implemented, that all of these people don't see themselves in prison for 120 years at least, like Keith Raniere. The offense conduct outlined in the indictment remains incredibly serious. The evidence against the defendant remains strong. And the defendant continues to have extensive financial resources and foreign ties, as well as the demonstrated ability to live in hiding for the long term, wrote prosecutors. And who's to say that Ghislaine Maxwell couldn't disappear even in America? What's to say that she even has to leave? This is a very large country. And we know that she is adept at hiding. We know that she's adept at skulking around in the dark and avoiding the authorities. So why would anyone let her out of their sight at this point? Furthermore, if we're all so worried about her state of uh, health and about her well-being, what better place than locked away in solitary confinement with people checking on her every 15 minutes or so? Seems pretty secure to me. Although the defendant now claims her marriage would keep her in the United States, her motion does not address the plainly inconsistent statements she made to pretrial services at the time of her arrest when, as documented in the pretrial services report, the defendant said she was in the process of divorcing her husband. Acting U.S. Attorney Audrey Strauss, Strauss wrote, and that was all. That's all about protecting her money, right? She moved the money into Borgerson's name, and then she'd say, "Well, we're getting, we're divorced. I don't. That's not my money." And they'd still be married on the hush, but she'd try and afford herself some protections to that dough. And it just shows you how smarmy she is, how scummy she is, and how not anchored in America. She is. Oh, she doesn't want to ruin her family. Give me a break. This bipedal serpent doesn't have the kind of heart that we do even. I don't even think she functions as a human. She's such a sociopath that love is such a foreign idea to somebody like Ghislaine Maxwell, in my opinion, that you can't even quantify it. On this point, it bears noting that the defendant's motion asks that she be permitted to live with, name redacted if granted bail, not her spouse, Strauss added. Well, that's weird. Her loving husband and her stepchildren that miss her oh so much. But yet she's not going to go and live with Scott Borgerson? She's going to live with whoever this redacted name is? Why in the hell is that Why in the hell would that occur? Why would she not go and live with this loving husband who put up 22 and a half million to get her out? He misses her so much that she's going to live with somebody else? None of this shit makes sense. It all fails the sniff test miserably. 
Maxwell's spouse, Scott Borgerson, whose name has been redacted from the public version of the court filings, told the court in a letter earlier this month that the person described in the federal government's criminal charges is not the person we know. He said he did not come forward as a co-signer to Maxwell's initial bail application because they were trying to protect their family from ferocious media aggression. My friend, if you're going to marry John Wayne Gacy, then it's not the media's fault if there's a frenzy when he's found out and you're put on blast as his husband or wife. That's how these things work. I have never witnessed anything close to inappropriate with Ghislaine. Quite to the contrary. The Ghislaine I know is a wonderful and loving person, he wrote in a letter accompanying the motion for bail. Aw, isn't that cute? Ghislaine is just such a good person. According to her redacted husband, (laughs) Scott Borgerson, she is such a great person. I am sure that all of the girls that were abused at her and Jeffrey Epstein's hands... I'm sure they all feel the same exact way. I'm sure that they are gushing and they're over the moon right now that Ghislaine is trying to get bailed out. I mean, what sort of different universe do these people live in where anyone thinks that these stupid letters are going to work? They didn't work for Jeffrey Epstein and they should not work for his co-conspirating bipedal serpent Ghislaine Maxwell either. A person familiar with Maxwell's thinking said that divorce was an option she had considered immediately after her arrest in order to protect the privacy of her husband and family, but that it was not pursued. Oh, yeah, I'm sure that it was all about privacy and had nothing to do with securing your money. Remember, money and information was the manna that Ghislaine Maxwell lived on for decades. And if you think that this is all the money that this lady has, then I, I'm, I'm telling you, I have some fantastic beachfront property for you right outside of Pahrump, Nevada. Prosecutors noted in their response to the new bail application that all three of the alleged survivors listed in the indictment continue to oppose her release. The government included in their filing a letter to the judge from Annie Farmer, 41, who has publicly uh, identified herself as one of the three alleged survivors. Farmer's letter expresses her doubts that Maxwell would show up for trial if she's granted release on bail. I think that this should be enough, right? Annie's letter should be enough for the judge. If I was the judge, it would be enough. Look, this lady is saying that when she was a little girl, you abused her. Now you're asking me to grant you bail while this little girl who grew up into this fantastic, brave woman is asking me to keep you contained in in your cell? It'd be a no-brainer for me, especially if I had already denied bail once and nothing new had popped up. You add the new letter here that we're going to dig into a little bit and uh, Annie's original talk in front of the, the, the court and in front of the judge. And I don't know how any judge could grant bail for Ghislaine Maxwell. This is from Annie's letter. She has lived a life of privilege, abusing her position of power to live beyond the rules. Fleeing the country in order to escape once more would fit with her long history of antisocial behavior, Farmer wrote. And again, if anyone would know how Ghislaine Maxwell functions, it's Annie. She was abused by her. She knows how Ghislaine Maxwell groomed her and procured her and prepared her to be abused. And if anyone should have some skin in the game, if anyone should move the needle as far as what the judge or the state does, it should be these three girls in this indictment and uh, anchored by Annie and her public statement here. Maxwell has repeatedly demonstrated that her primary concern is her own welfare and that she is willing to harm others if it benefits her, Farmer continued. She is quite capable of doing so once more. 
she will not hesitate to leave the country, irrespective of whether others will be on the hook financially for her actions because she lacks empathy and therefore simply does not care about hurting others. I agree 100% with that. And furthermore, the $22.5 million that Borgerson quote-unquote raised is Maxwell's money in my opinion. Anyway, I believe that it was Maxwell's money and she is saying that obviously it's her quote-unquote husband's money. So if she did bounce, she'd be bouncing with her own dough, not Borgerson's. So screw the nonsense, forget the BS, and Annie is 100% right in my opinion. Ghislaine Maxwell would be a no-show. At Maxwell's initial detention hearing in July, prosecutors conceded that they were not alleging Maxwell presented a danger to society if released on bail, but argued that her finances were opaque and that she was the very definition of a flight risk. And while I don't know how much I agree with that, like, I don't know if I would call Ghislaine Maxwell a, um a danger to society at this point, meaning I don't think she's going to be engaging in abusing anybody else at this point, but she's a danger if she's out of prison because who knows with her contacts what sort of nonsense she could get up to with people threatening these survivors and stuff. We've seen it before. It's not out of the realm of possibility. We've heard that Maxwell uses threats. So again, she might not be a threat to society at large, but to the survivors... It's a very different story, in my opinion. More than $22 million of the assets Maxwell has pledged to secure the proposed bond would come from the combined resources of Maxwell and her husband, with the remainder to be posted by a handful of close family and friends, according to Maxwell's court filing earlier this month. And there's that little nugget, right? A combined resources of Maxwell. So, again, this is Maxwell's money. They're saying it's Borgerson's, in my opinion. But it's really Maxwell who would be on the line for this dough anyway. So, again, why would she not flee? Maxwell's lawyers noted in their motion for bail that she and her husband have filed joint federal tax returns since 2016. Prosecutors did not challenge the accuracy of the couple's tax filings, but argued in their opposition that most of the couple's reported assets were Maxwell's to begin with, and that she had slowly funneled the majority of her wealth to trusts and into her husband's name over the last five years. Of course, and and tax returns are all fine and well, but you're not claiming your shadow money anyway. You're not claiming dark money. You're not claiming the money that you have stashed. So tax returns are a good baseline, but they don't tell the whole story. And Maxwell was most assuredly funneling money into Borgerson's name. She knew that the writing was on the wall, that they weren't going to get away with this forever. And then once Epstein got arrested, forget it. Everything went into overdrive. As a result, the government contends, if Maxwell were to flee, she would largely be sacrificing her own money and assets, thereby limiting the moral suasion of her spouse co-signing the bond, prosecutors wrote. This is a shrewd strategy by the, the prosecutors, and it's the same strategy that I would have pursued. I would have made the point and made it forcefully that this money is Ghislaine Maxwell's to begin with. So why would we think that her fleeing would have this huge negative impact on all of these other people. Give me a break already. The government The government also alleged that Maxwell's proposed bail package would still leave her with substantial resources to flee the country. Maxwell's proposal does not change the government's position that the defendant has considerable financial resources and could live a comfortable life as a fugitive, prosecutors wrote. And that, again, the government knows more than they're letting on here. Do you really think that the government doesn't know that these people have offshore accounts and then they're not digging through them or trying to get access to them? Do you think that Allison Moe and Audrey Strauss are not in contact with uh, Denise George? They are. So I would think, and obviously this is speculation on my, on my part, that the government has an ace up its sleeve still. And that ace up its sleeve is a superseded indictment that includes RICO. 
Maxwell, 58, is the Oxford-educated daughter of Robert Maxwell, the larger-than-life publishing baron whose rags-to-riches story captivated England. She lived an extravagant life among the British so-called elite until her father's business empire collapsed in the wake of his death in 1991. She decamped to New York looking for a fresh start and was soon seen in the company of the mysterious multi, multi-millionaire Epstein, pedophile. And it wasn't mysterious, right? I, you know, my opinion is that this was all set into mo- motion by Robert Maxwell. He was the one who set up uh, Epstein with his daughter and it was to run this honey trap operation. Maxwell was an asset, Epstein was an asset, and Papa Maxwell most assuredly was an asset for multiple intelligence organizations. So it wasn't the story they wanted, they told at first, right? Oh, it was the money, Maxwell was destitute. I don't buy any of that. This was all set into motion, and this was a plot that was kicked into play with a lot of premeditation. Following Epstein's death in August 2019, prosecutors vowed to hold accountable anyone who allegedly conspired with him or participated in his alleged child sex trafficking crimes. Their attention quickly turned to Maxwell, who had been previously accused in civil lawsuits of facilitating Epstein's abuse of young women and girls, allegations that she has long denied. She was arrested on July 2nd in a surprise early morning raid at a secluded 156-acre property in New Hampshire that had been purchased by a shell company, an all-cash transaction, according to court records and public documents. Those shell companies we talk about in the Finson files sure are looming large in this case, aren't they? That has always been a thread that was big time, a thread that was hugely important. And I'm so grateful for the Finson files to give us the ability to go down that rabbit hole and tie it in with our story because it's such a huge deal. Maxwell's lawyers have argued that she went into seclusion after Epstein's death in order to avoid media scrutiny on her and her family rather than to avoid arrest. But prosecutors argued in their opposition that whatever the reason, her time in isolation makes clear that, even to the extent she has loved ones and property in this country, she has proven her willingness to cut herself off entirely from them and her ability to live in hiding. And that's a great point by the prosecutors as well, right? Even if she says she was hiding from the uh, media, she was still proving that she could elude people, that she knew how to live on the run. So that is a good strategy by uh, the prosecution here. I think that is something that will win with the judge. If granted bail under her proposed conditions, Maxwell would be restricted to a New York residence with round-the-clock security and GPS monitoring. She would also irrevocably waive her rights to contest extradition from France or England, the two countries other than the U.S., where Maxwell holds citizenship. Sorry, that is not good enough for me. What if she goes and hides underground in France with friends, people hiding her and protecting her there, or England, or elsewhere? Nope, it's too much of a risk in my opinion. Prosecutors countered that GPS monitoring would offer little value for a defendant who poses such a significant flight risk because it does nothing to prevent the the defendant's flight once it has been removed. At best, home confinement and electronic monitoring would reduce a defendant's head start after cutting the bracelet. And they contended that her proposed waivers to contest extradition would likely be unenforceable and effectively meaningless if she were to flee. For, for sure. She doesn't control what the French courts do. She has no control over that. If the French didn't want to set a precedent of sending her to America, then they damn well would not do it. Point blank, period, no matter what rights Maxwell supposedly waves. Maxwell's lawyers will have one more opportunity to counter the prosecution's argument for her continued detention. They've asked U.S. District Judge Allison Nathan to schedule a hearing next week on her renewed bail package. 
Nathan has not yet committed to a hearing and may issue her decision solely on the written arguments. So there you have it, folks. The prosecution has clapped back. They have responded to the assertions of Ghislaine Maxwell and her legal team, and they have done so forcefully. My opinion is Ghislaine Maxwell should not get bail. She should stay in there eating bologna sandwiches and enjoying the accommodations provided to her by the federal government until her trial date. If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All of the links that go with this episode can be found in the description box. And to everybody who has donated to the podcast and helped keep the lights on around this joint and the content rolling, you folks are the real superstars of the operation. All right, everybody. Enjoy your Saturday. I plan on watching... 14 UFC fights, a bunch of championship football games, and the Canelo fight afterwards. So tomorrow's Daily Drop will be a little bit earlier than usual. Um, I'm going to put it out before I settle my ass onto the couch to watch all of the fantastic sporting events. So expect the Daily Drop no later than 3 p.m. or so tomorrow. All right, folks, enjoy your time, and I will talk to you all later.